Appendix A, Valery Sablin's Address to the Soviet People Attention comrades, attention to the words of this announcement, which we are trying to broadcast on radio and television. First of all, many thanks to you for your support, without which I would not be able to speak to you today. Our announcement is not a betrayal of the motherland, but a purely political, progressive declaration, and the traitors to the motherland are those who would seek to stop us. My comrades want me to pass on to you our assurance that if our nation is attacked, we are fully prepared to defend it. Right now, we have another goal, to take up the voice of truth. We are quite certain of the necessity of setting out our views on the internal situation of the country. We want to present our criticism of the policies of the Central Committee of the CPSU and the Soviet government before the honest people of the Soviet Union, who have been witness to the fact that decision on the social, political, economic and cultural life of our country are not made on the revolutionary principles of Marxism-Leninism, but merely on their slogans. I turn your attention to the words of Lenin in Revolution and the State, when he noted that after the death of great revolutionaries, attempts are always made to turn them into icons, to canonise them and use their famous names for class oppression. They make fools of us all as they gut the foundations of revolutionary learning, dulling its edge and debasing it. The teachings of Lenin deal with this in full measure. You only have to spend enough time learning them to be persuaded of just how badly they contrast with real life. Lenin dreamt of a just and free state, not a state of harsh repression and political tyranny. In one of the letters he wrote just before his death, he said, Workers who become members of the Central Committee should not, in my opinion, be drawn primarily from those who have spent a lot of time in the Soviets. These workers are already biased towards a status quo that they've just recently fought against. The majority of Central Committee members should be drawn from the level of workers just below that those who spent five years or so working their way up through the ranks and are closer to your average worker and peasant. Lenin saw the Central Committee as a party organ by which the proletariat could control the affairs of state. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. Now the Central Committee and the government are birds of the same feather, or more precisely, the same bird. Lenin and Marx said that every revolution was a step forward in the class struggle, and the oppressive nature of the state would gradually give way to a more open society. But as Engels pointed out, the state keeps its official face as a servant of the people while its institutions continue to dominate over them. I don't think there's any argument that these days the servants of the state have already become masters of the state. Everyone can see examples of this in everyday life. We see it in the parliamentary games and the so-called elections of Soviet officials. The fate of the people lies in the hands of an unelected elite in the form of the Politburo. The all-encompassing concentration of state and political power has become an established and well-known fact. In particular, the development of the revolutionary process in our country played a fatal role in crushing dissent during the cult of personality under Stalin and Khrushchev. In case you didn't know, up to 75 people are arrested annually for their political beliefs. Truth is something that no longer exists in our country. This is the first symptom of a seriously ill society. The attempt of the Soviet elite to create a cult of personality in a socialist society is a consequence of poor leadership. It contradicts Marxist-Leninist teachings about the role of the individual in history. These lies do nothing but embarrass the state and party leadership that hides behind them. People like Khrushchev, Beria, Malenkov, Molotov, Kaganovich, Shalest and others mysteriously disappear from the political arena with nothing more than a short piece in the newspaper. No trial, no witnesses, nothing. They spoon-feed information to the masses and they keep them in political ignorance, but the people must be politically active. They need to be aware of their significance and greatness. The people shouldn't live without political freedoms the same way they live without material comforts. Evidently, the current leadership of the CPSU has forgotten this. The people cannot forget it, because they live with it. The same democratic achievements that the revolution has created over the last 50 years have been ground to dirt by the state, leaving only an empty shell. Be proud of the past as you dream of the future, but don't lose sight of the present, and don't look for the revolution in the base appeals of modern Soviet ideologues. 
The state teaches the people to be passive and to believe in the infallibility of its high officials. You might be asking, where can I find such criticism of the higher-ups in the media? We are the exception. We must honestly confess that we don't have any control over the political or state institutions that might solve some of the controversial problems concerning the social, political, economic and cultural life of our country. All of this is under the influence of party and government organs, the so-called vanguard of the proletariat, who've been responsible for the development of our society over the last 50 years, have produced a system in which people find themselves trapped in a stagnant atmosphere of blind obedience to authority. It's an atmosphere of political tyranny and censorship in which fear of criticising the party of other government institutions thrives, since everyone's fate is tied to it. I must recall the words of Marx when he said, The moral state assumes its people have a sense of civic virtue, even if they protest against it. Lenin thought that any group of citizens which had attained a certain number of members or gathered a certain amount of signatures could publish their own newspaper, and he wrote about this on two occasions. Our people have already suffered much, and they continue to suffer from this political oppression. Only among the narrow circle of the party elite is it fully known how much damage has been done, and is being done, by the deliberate interference of state and party organs in the development of science and art, in the growth of the armed forces and the economy, and in raising the nation's youth. Of course, we too have laughed a million times at Rakin's satire, Crocodile Magazine, and the Wick Film Journal, but our laughter is mixed with tears at the thought of the motherland's future. The time for laughter has passed. It's now time to win over the people in the court of national opinion and demand that this bitter laughter be accounted for. A dangerous situation is now arising in our country. On one hand, there is the party line, the outward appearance of communal harmony and social consensus in a people's state. On the other hand, there is individual dissatisfaction with the current state of affairs. This dissatisfaction manifests itself in the passivity of the generation now reaching middle age, who dream of their upcoming pensions, and in the growth of that other cult, the cult of personal success. The contradiction between the individual and the collective grows wider, and the youth of our country withdraws even further from the political holy ground that we worship so much. The young people in particular sense the gap between revolutionary slogans and revolutionary deeds. The older generation, which for the most part still embodies the spirit of the revolution, also senses a crisis, but there's no longer a new burst of energy for it. We aren't condemning them, but thanking them for what they did in the name of mankind. They were revolutionaries in their own way, and this was their great mission. There's currently a big theoretical examination of our society's philosophical, economic, social and political future. In the midst of this examination lay the seeds of a revolution, for the revolution is a powerful movement of the community spirit, a colossal shift in the atmosphere that challenges the masses to action. It embodies the real change that is possible in the socio-economic structure. Our declaration is only one small part of it, which must serve as the spark. We do this to inspire debate about the direction of our country. We need more than just debate. We need to really look at the foundations of our society. I can respond right away to all opponents of Marxism-Leninism that we in no way reject the revolutionary principles of Marxist-Leninist theory. It plays a vital role in the socialist revolution. It has been, and will continue to be, a reliable basis for the new revolutionary ideal that stands before us. It just needs to progress a little further, since history has strangled its development. We categorically reject any attempt to portray us as agents of capitalism and destroyers of socialism. No. We affirm to everyone, as we have before, that socialism is the progressive framework of all our relations. It has created the progressive social and economic relations that were a prerequisite to the communist revolution, but it has since lost its revolutionary character and become a break on the progressive development of our society. Our society, on its path to communist revolution, might only be interested in the pursuit of happiness, but happiness is the movement towards communism. We already have an agenda set before us. Will the communist revolution fight the class war as an armed struggle, or just a political one? This depends on a number of factors. First, the people must believe the necessity for social reform, 
and believe that this path can only be achieved through communist revolution. This is a long process of social understanding and political consciousness. Second, in the very near future, an organized and inspired revolutionary force must be created, which will become the new revolutionary party, relying on a more progressive philosophy. Finally, as far as the senior leadership is concerned, the fact that they may offer violent resistance to our revolution, drowning it in the blood of the people, depends primarily on which side the armed forces and militia choose. It might only be a theoretical assumption, but with modern means of communication and transport as well as the high cultural level of our people, the great experiment of social revolution in the past will enable them to come up with a government that will not resort to violent counter-revolutionary measures. Instead, they will direct the revolution along a peaceful path of development. We can never forget, however, that revolutionary vigilance provides the foundation for its very success, and therefore the people must be prepared for history's diverse turn of events. Our main problem at this moment is that until there are networks of revolutionary circles around the country, there are no trade unions, youth or community organisations free from government influence. They will grow rapidly in a free society as mushrooms after a rainstorm, but the big problem now is to instil within the people an unshakable faith in the vital necessity of the communist revolution and convince them that there is no other path, all others will lead them to larger, more complicated torment. And the doubts one generation has about the revolution only grew more destructive and severe with the next generation. This belief in the necessity of revolution will, with the fresh rain, take root in the new organisations. Thus, we have a new potential revolution that paints the following picture. The use of all kinds of media to launch a campaign of agitation and propaganda to inspire revolutionary activity among the people with the aim of creating revolutionary cells. A variety of community organisations will be created across all sections of society to fight for change, for freedom of speech, the press and assembly. A new revolutionary party will be created, willing and able to bring the masses to communists through a new order. Finally, a just new society will be created that can bring material well-being and social equality to all of its members on the basis of the communist principle from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. How quickly this will come about is difficult to say, but it will be significantly faster than it has been in the past. The question that comes to mind is, which class will dominate this revolution? It will be the working class, both the worker peasant intelligentsia to which we belong and the engineers and technicians from industry and agriculture. The future belongs to this class, which will gradually turn into a classless society after the communist revolution. Who will oppose this class? What does the face of the enemy look like? It's the current ruling class. They're smaller in number, but have the power of the economy, finance and the media concentrated in their hands. This is the foundation on which they've built the apparatus of state power that props them up. This class consists of party and union officials, along with the directors of heavy and light industrial collectives and the trade centre, who use Soviet law, they of course would never admit to breaking those laws, and industry for their own personal enrichment. They have used their positions in society to establish a state network through which they are provided special material and moral privileges. This new system of exploitation is made possible by distorting the government budget, something which needs to be looked at and exposed in greater detail. This begs another question. What are our views on foreign policy and defence issues? I'll begin with the question of defence. We still believe that the threat of war remains, and we call upon the armed forces, especially the air defence and strategic rocket forces, to continue their defence of the motherland from foreign aggression during the turmoil and social reforms of the revolution. We ask them to abide by their strict revolutionary principles and not turn their arms against the revolution. We approve of and support peaceful coexistence and are convinced that the communist revolution will present great opportunities in this regard. We consider it necessary to create a national dialogue so all the people can discuss the government's foreign policy. We also think it's important to limit the role of the state and party institutions in the conduct of this policy. In the field of international relations, our communist revolution will encourage the social development of all nations on every continent. Mankind will come significantly closer to the creation of a harmonious social order all over the world. And finally, 
the key question of any revolution, the question of power. First of all, we suggest that the current state apparatus will need to be thoroughly purged, the machinery smashed and thrown out into the trash dump of history. It's thoroughly infected by nepotism, bribery, careerism and arrogance. Second, the electoral system, which has reduced the people to nothing more than a faceless mass, also needs to go. Third, all the conditions that have given birth to omnipotent and unaccountable state institutions must be removed. Can such questions be decided by a dictatorship of the proletariat? Absolutely. Otherwise, the revolution comes to an end after it seizes power. Only through the extraordinary vigilance of the people can society set out on the path to happiness. As you can see, the struggle before us is both theoretical and practical. Right now, the most vital task is to rally all honest, revolutionary-minded people around us. People who will be able to come together and apply their energy, dedication and purpose to the cause. These people will form the core of our revolutionary party. They will be extremely critical during the inevitable period of theoretical confusion that will accompany our struggle. There will be a part of society that will reject it. This is especially true of those politically immature and irresponsible elements who favour anarchy and tyranny. It's still possible to bring about a party that has a concrete agenda and honest policies which have the people's interests at heart. The circle of history will then turn back to its proper course. In conclusion, I want to outline our future plans. First, we are demanding that our ship be recognised as free and independent territory. Second, we are demanding daily broadcasts on radio and television for 30 minutes after the programme Vremia. Our goal will be to use our television broadcasts as a tribune to oppose the current regime, which demands of its people a passive acceptance of the status quo in the hopes that everything will eventually turn out all right. Third, we are demanding the right to publish our own newspaper and distribute it throughout the country. Our wider political message will be addressed to people of all persuasions and appeal to writers, poets, composers and average citizens. Their work will serve the revolution. We want to correspond and meet with representatives from all walks of life. Our address will be Leningrad Main Post Office, PO Box 49258, General Delivery. If the government tries to crush us by force, then you will know this when we fail to appear on radio and television. In this case, only your political activity will save the revolution we have begun. Thank you for your statement. Thank you for your attention. And now we bring you this message addressed to the fleet commander. I request that you report to the Politburo of the Central Committee CSPU and the Soviet government that the BPK Storozhevoy has hoisted the flag of the new communist revolution. We demand the following. First, to declare the Storozhevoy free from state and party institutions. Second, to allow one member of the crew, a man of our choosing, to go on state radio and television for 30 minutes from 2130 to 2200 hours Moscow time every day. Third, to guarantee the Storozhevoy the same privileges as any military base. Fourth, to allow the Storozhevoy anchorage and mooring buoy in any port in Soviet waters. Fifth, to secure mail delivery for the Storozhevoy. Sixth, to allow broadcasts from the Storozhevoy's radio station on the Mayak network in the evenings. Seventh, to allow members of our crew ashore unmolested. Eighth, to use no kind of violent coercion against the crewmen's families, parents or loved ones. Our declaration is purely political in nature and should in no way be construed as a betrayal of the motherland. We expect a reply to our demands within the next two hours. In the event that there isn't one, or our demands are rejected and an attempt is made to use force against us, responsibility for the consequences rests entirely with the Politburo, the Central Committee and the Soviet government. According to KGB comments of the transcript, there was one more broadcast on Valery Sablin's tape, and it went like this. I am making this broadcast to all stations that can hear me. This is the BPK Storozhevoy. We demand that the fleet commander, the Central Committee and the Soviet government provide an opportunity for one of our crewmen to speak on state radio and the Soviet government provide an opportunity for one of our crewmen to speak on state radio to present our aims to the Soviet people. We are neither traitors to the motherland nor adventurers seeking recognition for its own sake. An extreme but necessary opportunity has come for us to openly address a range of questions about the political, social and economic development of the country. 
The future of our people should be discussed by everyone, without pressure from the state or party. We decided to make this announcement with a clear understanding of the responsibility we have for the fate of the motherland, and with a sincere desire to achieve genuine communist relations in our society. But we also recognise the danger of physical and moral destruction at the hands of state institutions or hired guns. Therefore, we are turning for help to all the honest people in our country and abroad. If at 21.30 Moscow time tonight you don't see a representative from our ship on your television screens, we ask you not to go to work tomorrow. And to continue this strike until the government ceases its harsh repression of free speech and you hear from us again. Support us, comrades. Goodbye. At which point KGB note this was the end of the tape.